What's up, guys? Welcome back to the podcast. This is uh, new for me. This is uh, very early, actually. Normally, I don't get on till about, I don't know, after midnight Eastern time. But seeing how my guest is in the UK, he's a few hours difference from me. I decided to hop on early. Today, we are joined by Mr. Terry Ellis of Pursuit Perfect System. All for you, buddy. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. How you doing? How you doing? How's it going, man? How's it going? So yeah, you good. Are, you are also a uh, YouTuber as well. You got a pretty pretty big YouTube channel over there. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's okay. I'm doing okay. You know, it's the sort of project that you work hard on. You work hard and you work hard on. Yeah, yeah. There's always bigger channels, but, you know, you, you're always trying to do the best you can and grow and, you know, you know, I suppose meet new audience and help new people. And this is really great to come on this actually. So thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me yeah, on. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. So, um, so what do you, are you, do you have like a business? Are you a dealer, strictly an installer or what exactly do you do? Neither, there? neither, n none of that, to be honest. So uh, I started this up as really just an enthusiast. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> interesting story. I, I used to be big into carp fishing and uh, there was lots and lots of, YouTube videos of people doing carp fishing. And yeah. I looked to, for videos on home cinema and hi-fi. This is a few years ago and there was hardly any. And I thought, well, you know, there needs to be some, if that makes sense. There's like a big hole where there should be lots and lots of video content for hi-fi and home cinema. So I'll, I'll start, start it up and, and see how it goes. So now I do this, I do direct live calibrations, obviously create some videos for, for people as well. So no, not a dealer, not an installer, uh, there's no commercial link like that, if that makes sense. No, um, nothing, nothing behind the scenes that might influence what you say. Is what right. I'm trying to explain. Oh, so, so you're like me then? You're like an enthusiast. Yeah, we yeah. just and an independent. It, yeah, an independent. Yes, yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, I thought you. Were, I legit thought you were like a dealer because you <laughs> you had all these speakers and all this super. Like people think I have a lot of high end stuff. You have way better stuff than I do. And you have tons of it. I'm like, what is this guy doing? I was like, oh, he must well, be a dealer because he's got so many speakers at his house. Well, I, I, I've messed around with quite a few different things and some really lovely pieces of equipment. Um, I've also put myself out when I started to go and you know go and see dealers or, or go out if that makes sense and go and go to shows and other bits and pieces because uh, again, it's like all these events are going on, all these things are happening and. They need to be documented. They should be being shared with more people. So I think yeah. sometimes people will associate me with that because of the videos I've made at dealers and shows and, and bits and pieces. But no, yeah. totally independent. Oh, okay. Plus you, plus you wear the uh, the professional looking work shirt all, in all your videos. Oh, wow, this guy's uh, <laughs> this guy's got like a like a real business. <laughs> I said okay. Well, f funny story. There's a logo just up there actually. Uh, yeah. I, I had about ten T-shirts made. All with the same logo and then uh -huh. recently i just changed the logo so those 10 t-shirts are now null and void aren't they so uh there's, a, there's actually a little logo up there we can you can kind of see the bottom of it here uh -huh. I've, I've, cut, I've cut that out of the shot on purpose so and, and because this is your show and not my show I'm, I'm relaxed today i've not i've just got a normal t-shirt on not a, not a, not a <laughs> labeled one you still look like you're at work though <laughs> oh uh, yeah this is work okay. isn't it really technically <laughs> technically it is okay so, all right so i guess i, I gotta change my line of questioning here i thought you were i thought you were a dealer for real uh, yeah, wow. i seriously thought no, you were a no, dealer okay well i guess we just... yeah well there's, there's something in that show only because i think sometimes people get confused because there are youtube channels that are from dealers there's quite a few of them nowadays yeah. so it's easy to confuse that and i think if you're an independent reviewer it's important to make people clear or make people aware of that and be clear about it so maybe i need to explain that better because you know a, a dealer promoting a product should mm -hmm. really be saying i am a dealer promoting this product that i sell um and, and really us as independents maybe we, well especially me maybe i need to make that clearer in the future yeah yeah i don't, I don't know i just i just thought that that you were like a dealer because i i see i see like a line of speakers I'm like nobody has this many speakers i was like i have a few speakers but you have a bunch of speakers you have like oh, twice as many yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this guy's definitely a dealer. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, no, the, the, the logistics of that is obviously difficult because you have to store them all, get them all out, put them all away. So, yeah, it, it, it would be easier if I had a dealer. Yeah, but no, not at all. No. Yeah. Oh, interesting. All right. All right. Well, 
So, are you more of a home theater guy? Are you like a like a hi-fi guy, two channel guy? Uh, you know what? I'm probably split right down the middle. Uh, I was thinking about this obviously before I came on camera because my, my background. Um, when I was a kid, I used to always have movies on, and I love movies. I love watching movies because I think I love the escapism of it. So, really, my probably my background. Um, the thing I love the most is watching movies. So that makes me a home cinema buff. Yeah. But at the same time, I really love the challenge of hi-fi. Getting the hi-fi system to sound really good is a. I know home cinema is hard, but hi-fi is different hard, if that makes sense. And I really enjoy that challenge. But I, if it was me, I, I would put a movie on or, or watch a Netflix series rather than listen to music. So um, that's just my personal preference. But at the same time, I, I've reviewed loads and loads of hi-fi kits. So it's really difficult to give you a, an exact answer because it is rich, literally down the middle. Huh. Okay, we were talking earlier uh, about the um, about the Arcam. Is that is it Arcam like the biggest thing over there in UK? Is like like the most popular? Uh, I think Arcam did a very sensible thing a couple of years ago. They included Direct Live into a range of AV receivers, and very cleverly they put it into the whole range. So the bot the bottom of the range product that they sold the AVR three ninety featured direct live and i think up until that point to get direct live in a process or an av receiver you was looking at a data set which yeah. is i think 10 plus top 10 plus thousand pounds so putting direct live in, a, in an av receiver that costs around two thousand pounds was a massive step forward for the availability and affordability of direct live within av products so i, I I can't say it's down to that exclusively because I don't, I don't know the business, but I would have thought that has helped to catapult them as an AV receiver company to more people, if that makes sense, because yeah. people would have been buying into Arcam for the room correction that they might not have done before because they didn't have any. So that makes a really big difference to a lot of home cinema enthusiasts. So uh, it, it feels like Arcam is probably one of the bigger ones now in terms of the UK market. Um, and some have gone like it used to be a few years ago. Pioneer, you know, Pioneer were the best AV receivers back um, quite a few years ago. But yeah. we, I don't really see them so much now, so it's it's difficult to say exactly. Um, what about think, where you are? What what is the, what is the big one for you? I think over here the most popular ones are going to be Denon Morantz because they're yeah. so easily. You now you can go down to your local your Best Buy and just pick them up or. I don't know what's in. I don't know what's still in business anymore. PC Richards or something like that. I think they're out of business though. Uh, but you go down to any Best Buy, Amazon. Those are the most popular ones, which I guess is not not the case in the in the UK. Well, it it, it possibly is. I think there would be. There's always a little bit of competition, isn't there? So yeah. I, I assume you'd either buy Yamaha or you would buy uh, Denon Morantz, or maybe you would buy or, um, the company with. Uh, I forget the name now. Anthem. Anthem would be an alternative, wouldn't it, as well? Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. They just came out with their their new line. Do you have any? Have you heard the new anthems yet? <laughs> not not at all. My, my experience of anthems actually been pretty small. Uh, like like we were speaking about before I came on camera, because of the direct live calibration work that I do, I get to see a lot of home cinema systems, all based around Arcam products mostly. So huh. um, I've kind of been quite tunnel visioned, if that makes sense, with with my experience over the last couple of years. Um, what what are they like? Are they good? Yeah, I, I would say they're right up there with uh with Arcam. You know when Arcam works mm -hmm. properly, right up there with with Arcam. Uh, this guy, Mister Snoots, says that Arcam is very similar to audio control and JBL synthesis. Actually, audio control and JBL synthesis is basically an Arcam, so it's the other way around. It's just they they add some extra DAX and some other different software over to the uh the platform which is known as arcam's platform and like all the uh, all the firmware updates and everything like that actually come from arcam and then they uh they kind of kind of come from one depository and they you download it from from that what is, is it depository is that the correct word but they all come from one location uh which i i do believe is from arcam <clears throat> so yeah they are very similar it's quite an interesting concept because if you think about the way car manufacturing has gone yeah you'll have kind of baseline baseline vehicles that then other other manufacturers it yeah. could be skoda volkswagen uh say it's, it's all this similar similar car structure but they're all still different so it, it makes sense mm. that it can work within home cinema as well why, why would it not economies of scale yeah uh, that's like, be better uh, for the consumer it's like honda 
Honda is like Arcam, and then Acura, <laughs> Acura is, is like audio control JBL. It could, it could be that way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mentioned earlier that you uh, you were running all LS fifties in your in your theater. Four surrounds and Atmos. Yes, yeah. Because yeah, I, yeah. I'm a hack. I had Kef reference front speakers, and for, for a long time I was thinking about go, going Dolby Atmos, and I really wanted to do it, and then other things kept getting in the way, and then I thought, I'm just going to do it, because if you don't do these projects, they, they can never happen, if that makes sense. So I've deliberated over what speakers to use, because Kef don't really sell a traditional, typical on-wall speaker that would match with reference or even the R series, or not one that I was happy with. So I thought, well... What, what is really good? I mean, actually, I was going to build my own speakers, and I thought, you know, that's just a lot of work. So what is the best monitor-style speaker that the Kef make? And the LS50 seemed like the perfect one to me because the right size, the right quality, the right shape, the right price. Um, visually, it would match as well yeah. with the reference speakers. So it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> uh, hanging uh, LS50s from the ceiling is a bit more work than it, it originally seemed because they're very very heavy um and i made the mistake of i bought very good brackets to hang them from the ceiling which would have worked perfectly but i made the mistake of screwing into the back of the ls50 where the speaker terminals are mm. and then if you, as you can imagine as i was trying to angle it the, the full weight of the ls50 was on the bracket and it was just constantly falling down yeah so i worked out through trial and error that if i screwed turned the ls50 on its side and laid it flat and screwed into the middle of the bracket then you could angle it any way you want and then that worked perfectly but i might be the first person who's done it so i'm the first person who's going to make mistakes aren't i so it's, you learn from the mistakes don't you i think i saw that did you you drilled into the speaker right yeah yeah oh, i had to yeah. because because how else would you hang it from the ceiling so uh <laughs> I, I think they make I... brackets they clamp they clamp onto them right well, well, that is what I use for the for the sides. So, f yeah, for, yeah. so they clamp left and right. But my 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 envision was to hang at an angle pointing down. So there's no way you, you the, the wall brackets maybe at tilt. I don't know, twenty degrees or something. Yeah, I needed kind of that that much angle. So uh, I used like a, a pro bracket with a with a ball joint, so you could angle it whichever way you want which all seemed like a great idea at the time, but yeah. uh, it was a little bit of work to make it work. The, um, the metas, do they have, uh, they don't have mounting points on the back now, do they? No, 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 not at all. No, it's, um, it's, it's not designed as a speaker for that, is it? It's designed as a, as a, a either a desk speaker or a stand speaker. It's not designed for, uh, crazy, crazy people doing, you know, Dolby Atmos things. Although I, I did speak to Kef about it before I, before I took the project on. I said, look, you know, is this even going to work? And they sent me some details of an acoustics company that had they had set up like a, a three-dimensional sound thing with LS50s mm -hmm. around uh, above. And they'd screwed brackets into the sides of them so they could angle them yeah. like that. And I thought, well, if, you know, it, it can be done if that makes yep. sense. But um, it was a little bit of work, yes. I thought, you know, after I saw your video back then, I was like, oh, wow. I was like, because I wanted to do something where I, I could have 11 of them. I was like, man, that would actually work. But then I saw you yeah. screwed into it. And I, w I would never do that. That would just bother me. <laughs> well, was, the, the, the thing I was worried about the most, if the screws came out, that speaker yeah. might fall and kill one of my kids or something like that. So I had to, uh, I screwed into it and I glued them with really like industrial strength glue. So that's, that's never, ever coming out. Um, and then obviously to, to take the weight, they are screwed in with massive screws up into the ceiling joists so it's a it's quite a it's quite a it, it's quite a structural thing if that makes sense but yeah. i thought cutting holes in the ceiling is just as structural and the room that uh, my listening room basically the whole top is sound uh soundproofing so yeah. there's multiple layers of insulation there's multiple layers of um soundproof plasterboard with other with green glue and stuff so as soon as you cut a hole in that you've undone all the money and the work you've put in there for soundproofing because you're putting a hole in the ceiling. So that was my other motivation for having speakers in the room rather than in the ceiling. So what what are you running up front now to match the uh, LS50s? <laughs> well, there's there's a hole there at the moment because uh, the, the Kef reference speakers, they are gone. They, they made way for some uh, for some money to invest back into the, my right. yeah, YouTube channel for a new camera setup and stuff. So uh, nothing at the moment. There's a hole there. So if, uh, we'll see what happens in the future. 
So did you buy all the speakers that you have right now, or or did you get them sent? Yeah. Did no, you, I bought bought, you bought all the speakers. Yeah. 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 Goodness. Okay. All right. Interesting. You got <laughs> a more money than I thought you did. Well, I used to have quite a good job before I started doing this, and now it's <laughs> completely different. <laughs> so, so YouTube is like your your only thing now. Your only gig? Yeah. Well, that that plus obviously direct live calibrations and, and a few yeah. other things that I do as well. But yeah, I've kind of I, I was working two full time jobs really doing YouTube videos and a full time job, and there's only uh, so long you can do that before you kill yourself, isn't there? So I thought, well, let's give it a go. I heard. Uh, I hear the UK gets some some pretty nice uh, stimulus, pretty nice stimulus checks over there. <laughs> the government's <laughs> been good through the lockdown, actually. Yeah, yeah. it's been helpful. Yes, yeah. That's, good that's what I heard. Yeah, one of my buddies over there lives over there. He says uh, he gets pretty nice checks. I'm like, look at you guys. Yeah, it's interesting because when you live in the UK, obviously you, you, you get this. And I don't know what else is happening around the rest of the world. I mean, the government do keep saying to us we're being extremely generous. And it, it yeah. does feel generous for them to be supporting people with the way they are. Um, but again, uh, what what's happening there? Do, do you not get something similar or? Yeah, we got, uh, I think we got like 600 bucks one time. And then we got, uh, what was it, another five months later, we got like 1400 bucks. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty okay. much it. I know you guys get yeah. way more than that. Well, I was like, what is it? <laughs> I'm like, what are these guys going to do $600 in, in like four months? That's going to, yeah. That's yeah. going to do nothing. Has that been through a lockdown period as well? Have, have people been able to work or have they not been able to work? Uh, yeah, I think it's kind of slowly getting back into things. Um, I know some places like movie theaters are still shut down, but I think where I am, they, I think they've kind of opened up theaters and stuff. And every time we go out, I mean, the restaurants are now packed. I mean, I went out oh, really? on like Easter, on Easter Sunday, and I was like, oh, let's go to this one restaurant, get some breakfast. And uh, I walked in, I walked out because everybody was like shoulder to shoulder. I was like, dude, I thought I thought restaurants are like social distancing. But yeah, man, there's like it was just like a normal day. I was like, nobody had masks. I was like, yeah, I don't, I guess, I guess the thing is over where we are for some reason. Cause, uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of weird. Well, interestingly to that, today is quite a good day for the UK in terms of retail. Retail is open back up. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that have been dying to have a demo of some kind of hi fi yeah. or home cinema equipment they've not been able to, unless they've obviously got it shipped to their home. So, you know, today's the day. If you're watching this from the UK, get yourself down the hi fi shop and have a listen to those speakers or that amplifier you've had your eye on for the last six months or whatever so so what were you uh what were you running for your home theater as uh, you know right right now what are you running in your home theater besides nothing in the front uh an avr30 rcam avr30 and then yeah. an rcam p429 which is a four channel power amplifier for the atmos speakers and then no normally i was running uh whatever integrated amplifier i had in at the time for the review for the front left and right so you get because you get seven channels off of the rcam uh how was how was it doing that yeah so five off of the rcam two off of an integrated and then four off of a, a separate power amplifier which is a way of s separating your hi-fi system from your av system so that way you can have a separate source separate dac separate amplifier for your front left and right speakers for hi-fi and then that integrates back into the home cinema system using a home theater bypass which i think is probably the best way to go if you want a really great hi-fi system and a really great av system it's it's possible to get really good stereo sound through av i tried and worked really hard at that for years but it probably is easier and you get more options you get more options of standalone dax and more options of amplifiers you know to tailor the sound more to how you like it so we're going to talk about different systems i, I think that is a a good way to go it's not necessarily the cheapest way to go but it, it separating the hi-fi and the av system it just it just gives you more options and more flexibility and there's there's less going on all at once if that makes sense so when you're listening to hi-fi the av is off isn't it so you yeah. haven't got that much noise and other bits going on so um yeah that's how i've set that up so you think having a uh, home theater system slash hi-fi system all in one do you think it's better to have it like all in one or would it just be better to have it two separate, two separate places? I think two separate. Uh, some people are lucky. I've got friends that are lucky enough to have two separate, full separate systems in separate rooms. I think that's the, you know, the, the dream of, you know, of, of a lot of people, but the majority I think of people don't have that luxury. So it's trying to make it work 
in in the room that you've got, which could be a lounge, couldn't it? It's not, you know, it could be you know whatever room you've got available for your hi-fi home cinema. Mm. But if you, I think if you can separate the systems, because that way, then if you think about it, you can get a stereo amplifier designed for stereo hi-fi, or you can get a DAC that's designed for hi-fi. You can get a you know a source maybe, but obviously you can use a source with AV, so it's a little bit different, but um, I think I, mean, I asked someone more experienced than me once before, and they said I was discussing with them, you know, AV being as good as stereo. And they said, if you break it down, if there's a thousand pounds budget to build an AV product, think how many things that AV product has to do divided by that thousand pounds. And then you think, well, thousand pounds into a stereo product, it has to do a lot less. So the component quality can be higher. And I, you know, it's quite a simple explanation and I'm sure it's not set in stone like that, but yeah. um, that resonated with me because it just makes common sense, doesn't it? Really in terms of, you know, build quality and component parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your, um, what's your go-to for speakers? Is it going to be the Kefs or? <laughs> uh, I've listened to some very good speakers lately. Very, very good. Um, I just got to spend a few weeks with uh, the ATC SCM 50, which is a legendary hi-fi and studio speaker. And what was great about that, I got to spend a good few weeks with them, listening to them in a passive variety. So with a separate amplifier and then i converted them from passive to active and that was really really interesting to hear the difference between a passive speaker and an active speaker with active crossovers and you know amplifiers built into the speaker all within the same speaker all within the same room without even i had to move the speakers to do it but i could keep them all the same so that was really very interesting and that was a very learning curve if that makes sense in terms of how a, a traditional speaker can sound and then other, other speakers I've listened to recently have been that have really impressed me was a company called Martin, which is a, Sw a Swedish company. They make a stand mount speaker called the Parker Duo, which is a, it's a very expensive stand mount speaker. But it, it doesn't sound like a stand mount speaker. It's, it sounds like a floor standing speaker for the bass that it generates and yeah. the scale of sound that it creates. So but they're, they're very expensive, but they, they was fantastic. Um, and I got to set up a, a system for a customer recently, a direct live calibration. So he had Klipsch Forte, either three or four, I wasn't sure what it was, with a, a, a whacking great big tube amplifier. And that was a completely different sound to a lot of other hi-fi systems that I've listened to. And certain times, sometimes you hear things and they make a they make a mark on you. And that system yeah. made a mark on me just for the, the, the way the presentation came across with such delicate gracefulness. It's like, oh, wow, that's... Uh, the, the that, that, that was yeah so they, yeah. you wouldn't think that for clips would you you wouldn't think they would sound yeah. like that but with this yeah. tube amplifier they sounded yeah. absolutely yeah, really sweet and delicate which is the opposite to what you would expect but yeah so like you have these have these experiences and they go in the i remember that i like that and then you try and you know <laughs> try and find it with, you? With, with with other things do you think the uh the tube is uh got a warmer profile to it which is which is kind of offsetting the usually brighter sound of the uh, horns on the clipsches. Yeah, quite possibly. Possibly. Quite possibly. Yeah. I mean, I, I, at the moment, I've, I've just been listening to uh, a Manly Labs tube amplifier, and that was really, really interesting with the KFLS 50 Metas as well. So I was listening to the, the tube amplifier, comparing it with a, a very good solid state amplifier, and the difference was so massive that I was like, oh, wow, I can see why people like tube amplifiers. There's. Uh, there's definitely something in it in terms of it's the things you can't, it's difficult to explain, but there's something in it. If, uh, if you hi-fi is your thing, obviously. So. Yeah. 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 Oh, interesting. All right. Yeah. Is there, was there a big difference between the LS fifties and the metas that you heard? I haven't compared them funnily enough. You know, every, everybody's done that comparison. So um, what, what I'm basically doing is I'm going to be comparing the LS 50 metas to about nine or 10, other stand mount speakers around the same price. Mm -hmm. So so I thought rather than do the comparison backwards, if that makes sense, I'll do the comparison sideways. Because if you're buying new speakers and you've got a thousand pounds, give or take, then you're going to be deciding between the LS50 Metas and these other speakers that you can buy, like the Bucarts that are there behind me or ATC speakers. There's, there's loads of uh, really good options around that price point you're probably going to be choosing between those rather than choosing between the old LS fifties and the new ones. Um, and I think if you own the old LS fifties, then 
you're either going to upgrade or you're not. I think that's a, a, an individual thing that, you know, some people I'm sure they will just will because they'll want the latest and the greatest. Others might not because they're happy with what they've got. So I felt there was more value in comparing them to what else you might buy rather than something that's pretty soon will be secondhand only. So, yeah. What's, um, how'd you come proficient in direct live? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, uh, I remember using room correction systems back with Pioneer and Yamaha back quite a few years ago. And I remember running them, sitting and listening and being, you know, half happy with the results that you would get, but never, ever fully happy. And I remember I, I tried to get into the Pioneer system and, and try and use Roo, Room Equalization Wizard, to try and, and, and then use what, what manual controls that the Pioneer gave you within MCCAC, which was really basic just parametric equalization to try and get a better overall curve measured in Roo. And after months of messing around with that, I still wasn't happy at all. So I kind of gave up on automatic room correction systems and started learning manual uh, systems. And I bought a Meridian processor because you could use Roo's data and feed that data into the Meridian processor which sounds like a perfect solution, except it just didn't work perfectly. It was quite a cumbersome way of doing things. And I'd spend hours and hours and hours doing that, and I still wouldn't be 100% happy with the results. Um, and I also started learning about acoustics, room acoustics as well. And then my cousin actually recommended Dirac, give it a try, give it a try. And it, it seemed too good to be true. But the first time I used it, it was the first system that I'd actually used that I could tell it to do what I wanted to do, and it actually did it, if that makes sense. So I would, mm -hmm. right, I want it, I want it to sound like this, and then you press play, and you say, oh, wow, that's actually sounding like how I expected it to. And then I kind of played with it more, played with it more, played with it more, and it's like, like a lot of things you, you can teach yourself. And one of, the, one of the things that's been a massive learning curve for me has been going out and doing calibrations for other people in other systems in other rooms. Because what I've learned from that is most of the times with room correction solutions, they give you a, what I think is like a static target curve or a static end result, i.e. just a, a certain target curve, which Dirac gives you as well. But mm -hmm. that doesn't always work. I find that never works, in fact. That, that gives you a sound but it's never the optimum sound. The optimum sound is from sitting there listening, trying to work things out. Right, let's push this. Let's push that. Let's try and take this up. Let's take this down. Um, let's try and make the system more, more, give it more clarity. Let's try and give it more bass. Oh, no, that's now too thick in the mid-range. And that's what's, I think, special about Direct Live is that it gives you, or the user, complete control. But it's, it's like anything. To me, it's, it's a tool. So if... If you, if I had a screwdriver or a hammer, for example, or a chisel, I could make something out of wood. But if you put those same tools in a carpenter's hands, then they would make something amazing from that tool. So that's um, how I feel about Dirac Live, if that makes sense. It's a fantastic tool, but you do really need to understand what you're hearing against what you're seeing, I think, to get the best out of it. Yeah. How do you think that uh, compares to um, using like the Odyssey app? Have you? Use the Odyssey app. I've not, no, I, mean, uh, I, ha I haven't seen any of that. So it's, um, I have no idea. No, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, so Odyssey is not big over there, huh, in the UK? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I've, I've kind of specialized myself with, with Direct Systems. So that's yeah. just been all I've, all I've played with. And, um, it, you know, as, as doing that as a service for people, I, I wouldn't go out and work on a system that I wasn't proficient with or comfortable with and confident that I could do the job, if that makes sense. So I've focused myself. At the moment, anyway, with Dirac as a as a product. So the um, I guess the spaces in the UK they're smaller than uh, in the US, from what I'm hearing, right? Yeah. Am I correct on that? It, yeah, it's interesting because I've I've done quite a few online based calibrations for customers in the US, and some of the rooms that you guys have is un are unbelievable compared to what we have to, <laughs> you know, kind of squeeze ourselves into here in the UK. Not not everybody. I did a, a calibration for a customer uh, back in, back end of last year. And he had an, a lovely house, and then he built an extension on the back, which gave him about an eight meter by an eight meter home cinema room that was about sixteen foot high, and mm. that was an amazing space, absolutely mm. amazing. And the scale of sound in that big space 
was completely different to the, the scale of sound that you can get in a in a smaller room where the sounds a little bit more compressed by by the size of the room. Yeah. Um, so that yeah, so we some lucky people do have it, but yeah, generally we have pretty small rooms here. So it's the uh, subwoofer situation, like over there. Do you really need multiples, or is it usually like a like a one sub ordeal with most of the people it, that you've dealt with? It's it, everybody goes goes their own way. Um, I think the advice to go with multiple subs makes makes sense because I've always found it's easier to integrate two of them than it is one, and it's easier to easier to make them a bit more. Uh, I don't know if I can swear, but arse kicking. I don't know if I can say that. I'll just say it once. So, because when when you push one subwoofer hard to give you really physical bass, it's much harder to push it hard and let it not be in some way directional sounding. So, yeah. when you have two, you're, you're half in the load, aren't you? So it's it's easier to get a more physical bass out of two subwoofers than it than it is for one. And then, I think I think naturally your ear is less susceptible to where the sound is coming from as well um what's what's the uh, big brands over there probably the same as as you have so svs rail uh -huh. are probably the, the two two known ones i think velodyne i think are making a bit of a comeback as well which is interesting that's, that's what i heard um, yeah m m and k is another subwoofer brand obviously over here um mm -hmm. There's, there's probably others as well that I should think of that I, that I haven't said I'll get shot for. Obviously, there's there's Arendelle. Or I think you've looked at their yeah. products, haven't you? Oh, you guys have that um, in the UK, Arendelle? Well, I, I had some of their speakers turn up or just Arundel. today. They've been taking a long time to come through customs, so I'll be oh, looking really? at their speakers. Wow, yeah, okay. so... Which ones? So, uh, the 1723 stand mounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, basically, the, 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 my plan was to look at um, a lot of different stand mount speakers around the same price point around 1300 pounds yeah and then look at some that cost a bit more to see what, what more do you get if that makes sense so if you mm -hmm. spend say 1800 pounds or 1500 or 2000 pounds how much more do you get is it worth you know spending more is it worth saving for longer and spending more that that's my plan so i've got a few speakers coming in here that are a bit more expensive to look at as well yeah i think um i think the build quality and those arendel speakers are they use a HDF instead of like the MDF. So they're mm. way more denser than I think pretty much every other speaker I've had for a review, except for maybe like the 803 BMWs. Um, but yeah, they're like super dense and it's like the baffle is like uh, HDF. It's like an inch and a half, inch and a yeah, inch and a half inches thick, almost two inches. So it's a super, very robust. I don't think, you know, I'm looking forward to listening to them. Uh, funny enough, a few years ago, uh, I, went, I did a little round before uh, buying the speakers that I bought, obviously Kef Reference Free. You know, you do the rounds, you go listening to different systems. And I, and I went and listened to a full Arundel system. It was a might have been a 5.2 or something like that. I can't remember. It was a few years ago. And I remember it being a very, uh, very, very clear sounding system. I, I can't remember the, the, even what model the speakers were. I remember them being very large. And it was uh, mm. very clear, very, very clear sounding. And um, I've, I've wanted to spend some time with them since that day, but obviously that's been, you know, a number of years. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. I think you're going to like them. They're not too expensive either. And uh, definitely the build quality is like way better than 90% of stuff out there. Well, it's, it's an interesting thing because some speakers you get your hands on and they feel really heavy and they feel really solid. And automatically you think, well, this is going to be a great sounding speaker. Yeah. And other speakers you pick up and they feel lighter. You tap them yeah. and they feel a bit more hollow. And then yet when you listen to them, they, they can still really surprise you in what they do. So mm -hmm. I've always wondered whether whether a more dense speaker creates a certain type of sound and a less dense speaker creates a different type of sound. And then manufacturers are designing that sound into the into the build. I, I don't know. I'd have, I'd have to ask some. But yeah, um, yeah I wonder, I wonder if it's done on purpose rather than just saving costs and stuff, you know. Couldn't tell you about that. I know engineer, but I know those. Uh, if you're getting the full size stand mount ones, I think the, I, I had the little small stand mount ones, which were about yay big. I mean, they were they're, they're about that big and uh, yeah. about that deep. And those are the could, small it could, ones. It, it could well be the small ones. Obviously, I could I could pick them up and carry them in, but it was a reasonable size box. But that was only today. I, I haven't unboxed them yet. So oh, you, um, you have now. Okay. Yeah, well, they turned up this morning. They should have been here. They've been waiting for them to come through UK Customs. So it's been a little bit slow. So, uh, yeah, so they're here now. So that's, like, review-wise, that'll be in a few weeks' a few weeks' time. 
did you get whole system or just a, a stereo pair? Just just a stereo. Oh, I, I get, stereo. Again, because I'm doing a, a stereo speaker, stand mount speaker group test. So it's yeah. lots of different, very similar, but very different speakers to compare. Yeah. You should try their whole system. They're pretty They're pretty nice over there. Probably send you well, whole system. well, I'm hoping that to, later in the year to do more home cinema review, reviewing because I say it's been, since I started the channel, it's just been hi-fi, hi-fi, hi-fi because yeah. that's just how it's gone. And you know, my if, if anyone was, was watching this and seen my channel, my listening room is pitch black. It's pitch black for home cinema, so it almost feels criminal to not to not you know put, put the home cinema system on and uh, review some products. Yeah, what's um? Did you did you I th did you review the the sixty two the Kef sixty two yet? Well, the subwoofers. Yeah, is that is that the micro one? Is it? The yeah, 62? the micro one. I you no, did, I haven't. Right? I haven't yeah. looked at them. No, 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 not at all. No. Oh, I thought you did. What's uh, what subwoofer have you got now? Uh, four rail predators in the room. Oh, at the that's moment. right. Yeah, that's right. I think. Uh, well, did what? you get it before me? I think me and you were probably like, uh, one of the first ones to do it. <laughs> well, I started with one, and then rail said, "Do you want to try two? I was like, "Well, of course I do. Two makes perfect sense." And you know, my room's not huge, and yeah. two was enough. Two was enough output. I could get really, really impressive, you know, scale and bass impact off of them, and I was really happy with that. And before that, I was I was using two SVS SB13 Ultra subwoofers, which were mine. That is, that is what I bought. So, to me, that's like that's like a nice amount of bass for most home cinemas. You know, two big subwoofers is going to be enough. And then Rail said, "Do you want to try four? I was like, "Oh wow, uh, yeah, do yeah. I? Don't I? Of course I do." So, <laughs> uh, and I was I was tempted to obviously you know one at the two at the front, two at the back, yeah, because that would have been a a better technical thing to do yeah. for base response but obviously the, the new rail subs are about stacking them so i yep. thought well you, you can't not stack them yeah. and have a bit of fun with it so stacking them up has been uh of course quite a really quite interesting experience and what what that's done funnily enough that's given me better base response for the speakers that sit inside it because the subwoofers actually act as a corner of the room so mm. I've left them there and I, I haven't even been turned on for months because they give me better bass for the speakers that sit in front of them. It's like, well, that's like a, like a double win. If that makes sense for, for that situation. You should have said, how about we just do six? Just let's make it six. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, six would be, uh, I mean, funny enough, a friend of mine has got six. I would like to, you know, yeah. I say I would like to do it, but what, what you find with four in, in a smaller room is that you can get better bass from four because you're working four less hard. But yeah. you can't work, or I couldn't work four subwoofers very hard because the output exceeds the rest of the system. So, mm -hmm. you know, for movies like your know, Godzilla's, there's only so much pounding that you, you can take before that pounding's too big for the rest of the system. And I, and I love a lot of bass. My room is <laughs> yeah. very, very heavily acoustically treated, so I can push the, the bass very hard. Some people but wouldn't agree with you there. <laughs> but it's, it, well, well, I suppose if you taste in deep digits, it's a little bit different. But for, for me, it's like there's only so much pressure it's going to handle before. I'll tell you what happens. It, it can swamp the rest of the sound and it becomes, yeah. it can become a little bit out of balance. So, but, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't tell anybody to not, to not run big subwoofers. The, uh, my, my advice would be the opposite. If yeah. you can have it, definitely do it. Um, cause that, that would be the kind of the advice we was going to discuss. Wasn't we, you know, where would someone start their system? What, what would be an entry level system for someone? And, uh, my advice would be, you know, if you're starting out as a home cinema enthusiast, you've probably got X amount of pounds or, or dollars to spend. And then you ha you have to share that across everything, don't you? And that's, that's probably got a lot harder in the recent years because of Dolby Atmos. Wow. I need to buy more speakers, more, more, more. But my advice would be never, never. Never scrimp on the subwoofer. Always, you know, don't think speakers are oh, just, you know, I'll cheap out on the subwoofer. My advice would be go the opposite. Buy good subwoofers because bass is the most important part of the whole home cinema experience, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, most speakers can sound good. And you, you don't have to spend crazy money on subwoofers to get good bass. But think about bass as being very, very important. That would be my advice for that. Do you, have do you agree? A... Do you agree with that? Sorry, do you oh, agree? Yeah, 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 yeah. I love a good quality, good quality subwoofer rather than just big and hulking. So they just, uh, you know, blend. You want them. You want it to blend seamlessly. If there's one thing that bothers me is when I see cheap speakers and then ridiculously overpriced subwoofers. <laughs> That's what that bothers me. 
I'm like, you should probably uh, what, spend more money into your speakers first and then work your way out to the subwoofers. Yeah, I wonder if it's different in the US to the UK. I think because the UK rooms are smaller, yeah, probably, naturally probably. people buy smaller, yeah. buy, buy smaller subwoofers. And uh, I understand that from a, from a domestic point of view. If you can only have a small subwoofer, then have, then have a small one. But it's better to have a bigger one working less hard than a smaller one working extra hard in terms of, you know, it just, it just again, makes common sense. So a, bi a bigger one working at 50% is going to sound better than a smaller one working at 90% in terms yeah. of its capability. So, um, yeah. Do you have a rail subwoofer video coming tomorrow? <laughs> How do you know? How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you do. Okay. <laughs> do you as well? Do you have one? Do you? I'm going to wrap it up after we get off here. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> do you have one or two <laughs> what videos subs oh no just just it was just one it was just the one it was just okay. one and got you there <laughs> <laughs> to be honest like, it came out of nowhere i had to squeeze it in in, yeah, in among yeah. other things so you know i had other, other work scheduled but it, it's uh, originally i was going to say no because i don't think i can actually fit it in work-wise but when they told me about it uh, i was like oh wow interesting one of the, the better subwoofers that I've listened to recently has been Rel's Series 812, which is, uh, I think it's about £2,600. It's, it's quite a chunk of money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it does what Rel subwoofers do really well, which is be great for home, for hi fi, be fast. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also big output, you know, for home cinema yeah. as well. Maybe not big output like a, a thousand or 18, but big yeah. output for most people in most kind of real world situations. Um, and a couple of them would be real, really good. So, uh, yeah. So when they told me about, I, I was, yeah, I was interested. I can't say, I can't say anymore. Can we? We can't say. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> That's not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I didn't know it was going to be like this quick. Cause I was, I had some, uh, B and W's in there and I was like, God, I got to move out these guys first and <laughs> work this in here mm. for the next week and a half or so, which, uh, well, I, to be honest, I, I squeezed with the one I squeezed it in. I, T taking four predators out is such a logistical yeah, nightmare yeah, for me. Yeah. So they, they stayed in. I, I squeezed one in with it. Um, I know that's not, it wasn't perfect, but yeah. um, well, you can see the result still can be good. Yeah. Um, did you take any measurements or anything? Do you normally take yeah. measurements? You did? Yeah, okay. always. Well, as part of direct live calibrations, that's really quite a useful thing. So you can see. I, you know what? I, I really like taking measurements, especially with speakers, because you can see things. You can see trends. You can see uh, consistencies with how how Bowers and Wilkins speakers measure, for example, yeah. compared to a Kef speaker, compared to maybe a monitor audio or an ATC. And you know, obviously, I had the ATC SCM fifties for a review, measured them for a direct live calibration. Then I did a direct live calibration for a customer who had the same speakers, and I could still see the same same trend, if that makes sense, the same sound signature going through. Um, so I, I find that really useful in terms of learning about products really so do you think when i usually when i review subwoofers or speakers i usually turn off room correction i, I noticed think, that i feel like that's cheating a little bit i think well i don't know i just think it is i suppose it depends on what your natural room response is if you've got a naturally good room response then you can get away with it but if you have a bad bass response in your room which my bass response is not good which is why i've got all the treatment which is why i got into you know dsp in the first place it would be very difficult for me to fully assess a subwoofer listening through my room i'd rather take the room out of the equation with some dsp and then hear what the subwoofer can do minus the room as much as i possibly can uh, I, I i think that might be a contentious issue but i feel like it's important to take away external factors especially with bass the room is the room can make the bass do this so if the if the bass is doing this because of the room you're not hearing the subwoofer you're hearing you're hearing the room if that makes sense so um but it depends on what sort of bass response you get in your room i suppose i i i find that i like to mess around with placement till i get like i know what my room sounds like yeah. so i find with certain subwoofers sometimes i can place them in two front or one in the back, one in the front, or one, if I just have one, maybe at this one specific spot in this one odd corner, it might sound better there. Cause I think most people, maybe they don't know how to use room correction. Maybe they're just going to rely just on the, the controls on the subs themselves and just have to rely on placement only. And that's like, in my mind, that's what I think. 
Although I can see where you, you where you come from too. But, but, I, but I think there's a, there's a great a gray area with this in the sense that you know we review products in our rooms, and our rooms yeah. are going to have a certain character, and that character is going to stamp itself on the sound of that system speaker's subwoofer. But a different room is going to stamp a completely different character on it, especially in the bass. So the the only real consistency there can be between my room and your room, for example, would be the work you do with the correction in the middle. So mm. that that can actually be a, a a consistency rather than an inconsistency. But you know, I, I wouldn't say anybody was, I suppose, right or wrong for, for doing for doing what they do what they think is best in terms of giving their customers or their viewers, sorry, the best information. Yeah, see, then I, then I think like if you're doing like an SVS subwoofer, for instance, like they have like PEQ and all that in the app, yeah. so you can really tell her, you can really dig down. That and that, that I think is a big benefit over other subwoofers, which is well, like a rel, which doesn't have anything like that. Yeah. You're basically just doing the phase and the high level uh, adjustment. And I would say like from like a maybe like a integration standpoint, like if you didn't know how to do room correction or anything like that, but you had what what was available on the subwoofer itself that you could really tailor that sub because it has that feature set. Whereas the rel, you'd really have to kind of do it by ear or really mess with placement options whereas the subwoofer app and the dsp could kind of tailor itself around it so so for, well, for my rational uh, rationale yeah. thinking that's a main big selling point for like these dsp subs where you can actually do it rather than having to rely solely on placement by itself well it, it, even with that you've got the gray area of s some form of measurement so with the SVS subwoofers, which are which I really like, I like the app control. I think that's that's fantastic the way that all works. But unless you've measured the room response for that subwoofer, how do you know what to apply the EQ to? So, so somewhere in there, there needs to be a, a measurement, and you need to have uh, a baseline to to understand. So, if somebody's got the ability to do that, they've probably got the ability to run some kind of room correction system, which most AV products have it in. So it, it, it's an interesting one because subwoofers like your J Audios, they have uh, yeah. the newer ones have got DSP with a microphone, I think, and you know, they'll do their own measurements and they'll set themselves up. I think Velodyne used to do that as yeah. well. So it kind of makes sense to have that and it can be a good thing, but it also becomes a redundant thing if you're doing all that correction in the processor. So for, for me, for example, running Dirac, I would rather turn off all the processing external and do all the room correction with Dirac in the receiver or the processor with the odd exception where sometimes I've used the, the DSP within an SVS sub to just help better get a better starting point actually. So, but in the main, I, I would have thought everybody, does everybody not do that? I, I would have thought that is a common thing for people to, to do that? their room correction, their processing in the, in the source. I, I, the, I think everybody does do that. I think that's yeah. the reason why I didn't do it. I was like, you know, what? everybody does it. I was like, I know not everyone's going to have a trend of, I was like, not everybody yeah. has going to have a trend off. So maybe the level of uh, sophistication in their room corrections might be better than everybody else's. So why don't I just rely on the subwoofer itself, just like we did way back in the day where we had to take our own measurements and we had to rely on placement. Uh, so that was my way of thinking. This would be f like fair for every subwoofer that I, re that I review because, you know, never, never, not everybody has the best uh, room correction yeah. uh, systems well, to I, their exposure to their event. I think if... If you're being consistent and if you're being transparent in how you do it and what you do, then I don't think you can do any more than that, Shane, to be honest, in terms of giving impartial advice to, to, to people that watch your channel. I think that's, you know, it's, it's consistency. So in my channel, I, I do a lot of Dirac. So I do a lot of Dirac measurements and I show, I, I don't necessarily show the curves that I put in because they're tailored for certain reasons, but I show the pre-calibration measurements for everything. So yeah. And that way I can reference things. So you can see bass roll off. You can see the, and you can see my room. You can see what my room does to the bass and, and to the sound of the system. So you can see why I use Dirac as well. It's like, you know, that the room really does not uh, play nice to the speakers and subwoofers. Yeah. Cause I had, um, had these, uh, these Escendo subwoofers in like they, they're like dual 18s oh, well. and, uh, they have their own room, their own DSP built into it. Mm -hmm. And I had the, uh, the owner kind of dial in and just tweak it really quick. And I had this oh, big, well. I've always had this nasty null at like 30 hertz for like ever. And then uh, he looked at the room, he took a measuring. He goes, oh, you have a null here, 30 hertz. I was like, yeah, that's my main seat. He goes, he's, he just changed the cue a little bit and just raised the, raised the, uh, the DB. And it was like 
perfectly flat. He goes, this is like perfect room. I was like, really? I was like, my God. I was like, I've been dealing with this null for like two years. He fixed it literally like two seconds. Yeah. He goes, it's perfect. You have a, like a perfect room. I was like, how did you do that? He goes, oh, when you take a measurement, just check the queue and, <laughs> and just do this and this. And I was like, wow. So ever since that, I, I've learned how to like learn how to do uh, placement and then adjust the phase and distance within the within the the receiver processor to kind of like work that out a little bit. Yeah. Um, obviously, if I'm doing subwoofers that don't have any queue adjustment, it's a little tough there. But but now, all these years, man, I've been I've been like loading up on subwoofers to get rid of that null. But he was just like, no, just do this, and it's super quick. And I think like that in itself because that subwoofer was able to do that on its own without any help from the the receiver i think that's a that's a huge deal because what if you don't have a receiver what if you just have what if you have like a stereo system without any room correction and you have an awesome sub with dsp which you can just use that feature itself which the rel can't do because there is no dsp in that well that that's that's uh a, a great point funnily enough because uh, uh, it's quite challenging to integrate a subwoofer for stereo with 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 no controls no distance no time i mean, I mean funnily enough when you when you spend time with rail they actually are very good at it because that's their job if that makes sense they do a lot of it mm -hmm. by ear i feel like i've got quite a good ear but it's not a very good ear in terms of a microphone a microphone picks up stuff that i can't hear but so it, it is possible to get a very good result with a hi-fi system with a what rail called a high level connection yeah but you are still then into the room related problems so the, the the room problems are there regardless of how like for example you put the subwoofer in the room the room has an effect on the frequency response that you hear and that that is there regardless of whether you're listening to music or or, or tv or what so it is, it is trickier with hi-fi to get that to get that base perfect if that makes sense it is trickier mm -hmm. and then subwoofers that might have the DSP built in can make sense. So long as they're giving you the right response, the response that you want, that would be my only uh, snag of that is, well, they're, they're giving you back to that fixed. They're giving you a set response that they think that you want. But if you don't want that response, you're then yeah. into a, well, I can't change it, if that makes sense. I, ca I can't manually dial it into how I want it, which is always brings me back to Dirac. And the reason why I like Dirac is because it gives the user complete control but that's what i wanted to speak to you about trinov because i've not seen any trinov products and I, obviously i know you've got you've got one haven't you so yeah. does trinov allow that level of control or does it does it not allows everything down to the fir filters and <laughs> to okay. everything yeah sure everything i mean i when i did the review i had to do a separate thing just for the settings because it's yeah so much it was like that was like a 30 minute video which uh probably boring for most people but i mean if you're interested in that then i show off all the settings in it but it's it's like way over my head there's so much stuff that i don't even know what it does uh quantum mechanics and stuff like that you know uh time oh, loops well. and stuff yeah you know. i thought i'd seen that i thought i'd seen it but i don't remember seeing that part of the video so maybe i missed that one i've, I've watched um recently of yours for for the trend of products but um how, how how much of a difference or how much of a jump is it going from what someone might own uh, I don't know, for example, an Arcan processor or that yeah. equivalent up to the next tier up, which is the £10,000 plus. How, how much of a jump up is there? Um, I think all the basic settings that you would get, like a mini DSP in Dirac is going to be there. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, there's integration with like triple crossovers. And um, like I said, you can pick between like Butterworth filters and your crossover slopes and link widths filters all this you have everything down to like the the littlest thing man like like i said like stuff that i don't even understand how to do because i don't have the measurements to do it or the understanding or the engineering behind it but um but everything you can do with direct you can do in there as well i mean you can there's re, base redirect which you can let's say if you have uh like a small small atmos speaker that you only want to run to like 120 hertz so you can run that to 120 you can take the bass from that and, and direct it over to the nearest speaker, which might have bass down to like 60 hertz or 80 hertz. So you could redirect the bass from the top over to the nearest speaker. And then from there, you can redirect it again over to your subwoofers. So you can, so you can do stuff like that as well. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to rack my brains thinking 
what what would be the benefit of that? How you would do it? Because no, normally you would just be transferring everything to the subwoofer. So there, there must be a technical benefit and reason for why you would do that. But I suppose they're thinking of bigger arrays, aren't they? The Trinov is designed for big bigger arrays of speakers, which ma makes a lot of sense if you've got a big arena and a lot of speakers. You're trying to, you're trying to create zones of sound. Yeah, um, you can also just redirect bass. Uh, you can like localize different. Like say everything from the left side, you can redirect all that LFE, for all, all the uh, bass from like eighty hertz down to like I don't know, like thirty hertz over to that left sub. All the bass from the right side of the room goes to the right sub, and vice versa, or to just different speakers. So there's so much you can do with bass redirect. So if you want to uh, have zones of bass, you can do that as well. It's pretty sick. I mean, once you dig yeah. into it, there's like so many, so many different things you can do with it. Obviously, you would need like a nice big size room to really utilize it. Yeah, a raise of speakers. That's, that's the 32 channel, isn't it? 32 channel processor? Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of speakers, isn't it? A lot of speakers, a lot of subwoofers. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of speakers, yeah. How many speakers have you got in your home cinema? Um, right now, I got. Uh, right now, I got, I got 11, 12, 13, uh, 14, 14. So, what is that? What is that? Four at the top or six at the top? No, I got four at the top. Four at the I top. got the regular seven on the bottom. Four at the top, seven on the bottom, which would be seven four. Uh, then I got the two wide speakers now. Then I have a back. Oh, the, 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 the eight and nine, yeah. For, for... yeah, and then yeah, one more. I, I wondered. I, you know, I want to ask you about that because that's what on my brain. It's like, oh, sh how much difference does it make having those there? Um, there's a little little bit here and there. I mean, there's not really a bunch of stuff in Atmos tracks that go there, but okay. I mean, if you turn on the up mixer, then it can it can kind of steer sound pretty pretty convincingly. So I mean, I mean, if you got the space, where, I mean, it's not like a necessity you need it, but it's cool that you if you can fit it. Where where those speakers made sense to me is because so, sometimes you have a setup where you've got quite a long room where the listener and the, the listening positions back. And yeah. the main array of speakers is quite a long way away, so there is a there is a gap if that makes sense, where the front sound stage is throwing its sound mm. a long way forwards, and then you have obviously where, where people sit on the back wall in their rooms, they they are normally sitting quite close to the surround, yeah. so you've kind of got like a headphone effect with the surround speakers being very close and the front array being a long way away. So I thought the eight and nine could fill that gap quite nicely, and it's it's, it's been it's been playing on my mind. Yeah, you know, should I should I have an eight and nine? And another two LS fifties sitting sitting there to do to do that. I wondered what that would be like. Well, their thing is uh, you can do the wide speakers, but then you can add an extra set or two or three set of side surround speakers. So that way the sound will travel seamlessly straight along yeah. the along that wall. So you don't have those big gaps. So it doesn't go from yeah. like left speaker then automatically takes a big jump over to the left surround. It just gradually moves down the wall. Yep, that makes a lot of sense for a multiple seating array. Yeah, I, I assume that's what it's designed for. So you have surround steering for front, middle, like rows of seats is what I'm trying to, what I mean. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, obviously for that because mm -hmm. that that to me is always one of the one of the challenges of uh, if you're putting together a home cinema, are, are you putting it, are you designing it for one person, or are you designing it for multiple people? And yeah. I think you'd probably take a different approach. If you was designing it for multiple, see, I, I'm selfish. I designed my home cinema for me for yeah, one yeah. seat, so it was it was kind of all trying to sit on axis to as many speakers as possible, which is why I got you know, used LS50 because I wanted well, I wanted to sit on axis to them. And for me, in ceiling speakers, I've always been a bit of a, a bit of a I struggled to get my head around the idea or the concept of having a ceiling speaker away from you pointing down when you're sitting very much off axis to it. And it, I mean, it makes sense for tall rooms, big rooms with high ceilings, or if you're trying to create sound in an array or an area, I think it yeah. makes sense. But when you're thinking just one selfish person, um, I've always thought it might, you know, the idea of a, an on-axis speaker makes more sense than an off-axis one. But I, I don't know what you, how you feel about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's different. It's um, like I, I could see where you're, like my room is basically kind of tailored for me as well. But then... Um, I think adding these little extra these extra speakers in it kind of makes it sound like it's a bigger like it's a bigger space. Do you know what I mean? Rather than rather than having everything directed directly right at you on axis, it feels it feels a little bit more. Uh, how's a word? 
it feels more like a more like a home theater esque sound rather than going to an actual cinema sound. You know what I mean? Like okay. the sound is bigger when you can have when you can place more speakers because sound does travel differently rather than. I know, I know when they say properly placed speakers sounds, you know, just as good as multiple speakers. I don't, I don't find that's the case. I, I, I find if you have, if you can fit more speakers, then as the sound really travels, it tends to get lost a little bit more. It tends to get bigger and it doesn't feel so intimate. I guess that's what I'm looking for. Okay, like your system okay. probably sounds a little bit more intimate than mine does, even though our rooms are probably the same size. But I, I, I mean, think, how, how big is your room out of curiosity? What, how big is it? Your room? Uh, it's about... Uh, I think it's like 14 deep, but like uh, 12 wide, and they're like nine foot high. Okay, you see, similar. Mine's a little yeah. bit, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. But yeah, I, I kind of sit sit more in the middle of of the room, so it probably is a similar ish distance. Um, uh, is it intimate? I, I suppose it depends on what sort of sound you're going for. Mm. Uh, I, I I like a sound that is quite uh, on me, if that makes sense, a physical sound, and for, for for me, the difference between a really good home cinema sound and, and, a, and an average one, say, for example, is kind of the experience. And I think a lot of modern movies are designed nowadays with sometimes minimal story, maximum experience. And that experience is coming, you know, from big visuals, and but big sound. And hmm. so the more of that sound that you experience, kind of the more physical it is. And I don't necessarily mean like ear, ear piercingly loud. It doesn't have to be like that, but... There, there is a physicality to a home cinema experience that uh, the more physical it gets, the kind of the better the experience becomes. But it's, it's interesting talking about the surround sounds because that is now that's, you've planted the seed in my brain there, Shane, in terms of uh, more, more speakers, uh, more ambience, isn't it? More, more, uh, yeah. more information, isn't it? Really, that was the thing I noticed. Yeah most with Dolby Atmos whenever you'd go to an early Dolby Atmos demo it was the rain demo wasn't it they always put the rain on which yeah I think well this is this brand new technology and all you can show me is rain uh that was always frustrating but what I noticed the more Dolby Atmos systems I was looking at is that they seem to have a bit more resolution to the sound compared to say a 5.1 or a 7.1 because there is more information there isn't there's more channels there's more direct sound in the sound stage so yeah. it makes perfect sense what you said in terms of you know more speakers, more direct sound, more information. T technically, it's more resolution, isn't it, to the yeah. to the overall sound stage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then yeah, I get it when people are just like, oh, five point one or seven channels is just enough. Yeah, that's cool, but I mean, if you can fit more, I mean, uh, Atmo supports it that you can do multiple side surround speakers, and it'll fill those speakers just as much as it'll, it'll fill like one set of surrounds. It'll do two sets of surrounds just fine. And then, um, you know, especially especially with that rain demo, like it sounds like it's. I know rain doesn't technically come from above; kind of reflects off the bottom, comes up. Yeah, but, that was but it all... does, but it's, uh, definitely sounds bigger over, over to the sides here, so it has a more more bigger 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 feel, I guess. Yeah, you could, what, okay. what, what I would say. And and, um, and I, I noticed this when I would compare it to like other AVR or other processors that I've had, which. Um, I would be like, oh man, you know, it's very, uh, very directional. You can hear things a little bit better, which, which is true. But then with this one here, adding some more speakers in, it's, it tends to just disappear a bit more because everything just opens up a lot bigger. Yeah. Which I don't something think I said you, you, that in my video, but. Well, so, something you mentioned in the, uh, one of the Trinidad videos was about, I'm sure you mentioned it about looking at, was it, uh, maybe it's coming from somewhere else, but you def definitely mentioned about hearing more into the Atmos mix. I'm sure you were talking about the Midway. Midway, is it Midway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Listen, uh, picking out multiple planes within the sound field because oh, yeah. uh, that's, that's an interesting soundtrack, that is, because I, I like it. I've got my issues with it as a soundtrack as well. I think it, it's very fake, but very impressive. It's, it's one of those oh, yeah, kind of yeah. soundtracks yeah. because they're not, I don't think they're recording people on a, on a battleship, are they? So the, <laughs> no. the vocal sounds very, very fake, but I, lo I love the experience. I love the experience of that movie. That is one of my test movies as well funnily enough and um but i'm sure you mentioned something like being able to hear more clearly the planes flying around in the atmos oh, yeah. Yeah, soundtrack yeah, yeah. i was that's like oh wow i'm interested by that yeah yeah you can hear because there's multiple planes and you could you can track them on the uh the atmos viewer you can see the balls moving i just could fly uh, past I, you, your head yeah i was gonna ask you about that i thought but maybe you didn't say it. I, I, I thought that's what you'd say that was do you think because you can see it on the screen you can hear it clearer do you think that's one of those psychological things 
Well, I think I, I, I watched that movie before I got the trend off. Well, be, I watched it before they did that update. And I could just, okay. you could tell. You could tell when it's just kind of like, or whatever you had. It's very clear that when it goes from front to the hit, it hits the top speaker, top front, hits the uh, top rear, and then just disappears in the back. I was like, oh, shoot. I was like, that's what the good surround sounds like. And, you know, when people talk about helicopters and planes, I was like, that's it right there. I was like, this is the movie. I was like, how much better does this get? And then uh, uh, the movie itself is kind of boring, but <laughs> that, that, that opening scene is pretty awesome, though. Yeah, well, that that and the uh, bit, bit towards the end, obviously. But the, the problem is, yeah. the more the more you use these films, is because you use Fury as well, don't you? I no, noticed that. Uh, I yeah, really yeah. like that as a movie. The, the problem is, you, yeah, you kill movie when, when you watch the same scenes over and over and over yeah. again. You can't you can't then watch that movie at a later date and not analyze the sound yeah. Yeah. of that scene because that you, you you program yourself to do that. It does kill the uh, kill the movie if that makes sense <laughs> from, a, from a from a enjoyment point of view. Yeah. I mean, uh, unless I'm like demoing it for a friend, I'm like, you'll check this out. And they're just oh, like, oh, <laughs> bam, look at that bass. Uh, but I, I usually, I like to have like the same demo scenes. I know people, I mean, if you're watching on a playlist, you're probably like, oh, this movie again, Shane. But I think the more that you're very familiar with a specific demo that you can, easier to pick out the differences between speakers and subs. Yeah. I try to, I try to have like maybe like eight or so which I'm really familiar with. Yeah. Then I might give like two or three demos and then try to switch it up between the eight and uh, keep freshen it up. So if you are watching like the playlist that it doesn't look like I'm doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. The thing is that it's important to have a consistency, obviously from a, from a setup point of view, but when I go out and do, do calibrations for people, I do the same thing. So I have a, I take a load of disc with me and I start with this one and I'll listen for something. Then I'll put another one on, then I'm listening for something else. So it's it's kind of very similar, really. It's like a like a review of the sound of the system, really. It's it's the, it's the same process. So, but unless you're familiar, how do you know where what you're listening for to start yeah. with? Yeah, plus it's always you can always go back to your own old videos and say, oh, oh, well, this is what I said about this on this particular oh, well, movie. Yeah. 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 The, what about uh, obviously the, the latest Kong versus? I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. The Kong versus Godzilla is that is that as good as the hype? And do you get good sound for a stream? I thought I thought it was like all right. I didn't think it was as good as the other movies. Did you watch it yet? Uh, no, I haven't seen it. No, no, I did. No, that's why I asked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I didn't think that it was as good as the other mixes. I thought it was very quiet. First of all, it was like very. Oh, it was wow. about it was about like ten, twelve dB lower than the other mixes. Because I noticed uh, usually when I listen, my volume knob is about negative, negative, uh, negative thirty one on my volume control. This one I had it up to like negative 20, 21, maybe negative 20. So I had to bump it up considerably. I was like, man, because we were both, I was watching with my buddy, my friend. We were like, yo, turn that up. I was like, this is my reference level here. <laughs> he was like, it's, I can barely hear it. I was like, ah, you know, when you find your level, you like, and you turn it up a little bit louder, you feel a little weird yeah, about it. Yeah. But I had to like really jack it up. And I was Did uh, you think do you think they scaled that down because it's a download because it's going to be watched by people on TVs and sound bars? Do you think that there's any influence there? Because no, I've always waited like for the disc, wait for the disc, wait for the disc. You're going to get the best wait for the disc, but the world's changing, isn't it? The world's changing massively. Yeah. So, um, um, I, I would have just, I would just assume that when the disc comes out, I, I would think it would be louder. Okay. And obviously it's going to be more dynamic. It definitely sounded a bit more compressed over this stream. But usually if I'm like watching something like uh, Batman v Superman and then I go back and check out the disc, um, some differences here and there. But as far as like level wise, they're they're like the same level. I think most yeah. movies are they're they're mixed at the same level between the physical and the digital. It's just the, uh, you know, the compression kind of hits different movies different ways. Some are clearly much you know, better recorded, yeah. more dynamic. Other ones you can really kind of tell the difference in, uh, in compression. Because I, I was just thinking back movie. to, yeah. Because I was thinking back Godzilla. to the, the last, well, yeah. Well, the last Godzilla movie was re insane base, yeah. really insane base, yeah, yeah. really good, good quality actually, really good quality, insane base. Yeah. O on, funny enough, that was one of the the uh, films that I reviewed the four Predators with, and I had to slightly change the calibration approach because there was so much output from four subwoofers. But the physical experience of that movie was. Not only physical, but it was clean, really yeah. clean. So I was hugely impressed by the actual. Yeah, it's an onslaught. It's a physical onslaught of bass and sound, but it, it's actually very good. Yeah. Um. And so I was wondering whether 
if they put that kind of physical onslaught on you again, which I assume they would with Kong and Godzilla, no, it's going to be the same kind of thing. Not even close. Like, I wonder if they would tone it down. It's not close, no? Yeah, not even close. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. How can that be? How can that be? I have no clue. I was really disappointed. We're just sitting there. We're like, dude, where's the base? We're like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, yo, I don't know. He's like, turn up the subs. I was like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Cause I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, dude, that's cheating. I was like, it should sound good. Like right off the rip. It should just sound good. Yeah. It just doesn't. I mean, I'm really fingers crossed that the, the, the Blu-ray is much better, but uh, we'll see, man. That, you know what? That'd make quite an interesting story. Whether, where, where did you stream it from out of curiosity? Where, where was the source? Uh, yeah, I streamed from HBO Max. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it'd be, it'd be an interesting story or interesting to know whether they are scaling the sound down for people's sound bars and TV speakers, wh whether that is even a thing. That'd be interesting to know. Yeah, I guess we'll find out a couple months here. I mean, that would be, I mean, that's that's a pretty big, I know people talk about like Disney mixes, but Disney mixes on digital, the same as physical. I mean, it's yeah. just not really that much better. But this would be a really big, I think this would be might be the, like the first movie where it'd be that much of a gap between the digital stream yeah. and the physical. If the physical sounds anything like the previous movies, because my my biggest thing with streamed content is sound more more than picture. It's definitely sound sound yeah. quality. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I love the. I mean, it's funny that now when you put a disc into a Blu-ray player and you wait for the menu to go through and then you go through the intro bit where they, they tell you about the piracy and then you go in the menu and it's it feels really really slow and cumbersome and old-fashioned compared to pulling out your phone and just google casting from your <laughs> yeah. phone yeah and it quickly quickly scrolling through things it's on instant so yeah the, obviously the disc is not going to survive we know that for for the future which is a shame because uh, you know it's still the best format to, to use unless streaming can be as good as a disc in which case that's better but i don't think it is at the moment so that's that that could potentially that potentially kills the whole home cinema arena, doesn't it? If they're going to give us poor content quality wise, then that that is a major down for all of us home cinema and hi fi and few home cinema enthusiasts. That's something we need to know, isn't it? Really, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you have a cloud escape, then uh, you don't have to worry about that stuff. What? How does that work? Then is that is that a different system? Uh, you guys have cloud escape in UK. It's uh, basically uh, you're just downloading entire movies onto the onto the hard drive. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. The system itself, okay. yeah. So not streaming, but you're actually just downloading the full full resolution film. It costs a lot of money. Don't get me wrong; it's like yeah. nine, ten grand. But uh, but uh, this is the next best thing for uh, if you're a physical media guy would be the cloud escape. I thought that, uh, I'm sure that went out of business a few years ago and then came back. Is, is that the system? I'm sure they had. I'm sure so, there was something related to that a few years ago but maybe yeah not. they've been around for like tw 20 years now but two decades oh, okay so it okay. was probably the same thing that you read yeah but yeah. Uh, hold on let's take a couple questions here before we uh okay we, we kick off i don't know it's um terry have you tried the bucard a500 a700 also to properly measure just use brew <laughs> I mean, to be honest, the, the first Bucock speakers that I'm going to get the experience with are the ones behind me. So the S300 Mark II. And obviously, yeah, pro pro properly measuring acoustics, definitely Roo, always Roo. The, the only thing I would say, <laughs> and this is nothing against Roo, Roo is a phenomenal software and the phenomenal the fact that it's free. But it's very hard on you as an enthusiast. So it, it's, it's brutally honest and it makes you very much obsess over graphs and obsess over things which is not a bad thing it's a good thing but yeah it also gives you a lot of sleepless nights because you, you, you listen to something you think it sounds okay then you measure it and the measurements are atrocious and you, you can't <laughs> it's uh, it's quite hard to take as a as, as an infusion it's like oh god that is awful it's, uh, how can i even listen to that so that, that and that's not a negative thing towards Rue at all but that's my only uh it's like it can, it can be very hard on you as a as an enthusiast in terms of um yeah enjoyment factor sort of, i suppose it's like saying if you measure two different speakers and then measure relatively the same, they still sound wildly different. Yeah, yeah. Well, me measurements are important, but there are different situations. Like, for example, at the moment, I'm using 700 mil speaker stands, and that doesn't measure as good as 600 millimeter speaker stands from, from a certain base region. Uh -huh. I still prefer the sound of the speakers on the 700 because of other factors. So, this is what this is what I meant about it. You can you can you can obsess over graphs, but sometimes you do have to consider other things as well. 
Yeah, that's why I don't do measurements for speakers. I I kind of hate doing. I only do measurement for subs just because I like to see the extension for my room. I always say it's gonna deco it's gonna couple yeah. different with my room than yours. But this is what I'm able to get in my room. But sp speaker is a little different. Like I feel if I do a speaker measurement, does that really correlate to what I'm hearing? I you know, I find it to be different. Like some I used to do it at the, at the beginning. Me and my boy would take measurements. We're like, does that sound like this should match? Like, nah, it sounds different. I'm like, yeah, it does, right? I was like, fuck it, we'll just we'll just use other speakers as comparison. <laughs> so I find that that way better than doing measurements. The measure baiters can go out there and, and go to the other channels, but <laughs> I, 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 I kind of keep the, the measurements for speakers at least away. I think, I, think I, I would like to understand more. So seeing a very in-depth set of measurements for a speaker, for example, fully understanding what you see would be would be a very powerful thing. But when, when you look at something you don't fully understand, it, it, it's not it's, it's, it's meaningless in a way. So you you need to, for, to understand measurements, you need to understand them. So that if, if you're presenting them, you need to fully understand what you're presenting. And then you've got to hope the person looking at it fully understands it as well. Otherwise, it, plus, it can be meaningless. Plus, you're kind of measuring at the speaker. That's You should probably take the measurement where you're sitting. Listening position, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think. Um, and let's face it, you take the measurement, the you take it at your measuring position, it's going to sound different than the other guy's measuring position. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's like, how do you really correlate that? You know what I mean? It's like the, that, your kefs are going to sound different in my room than, than they're going to sound yeah. in yours. But I've measured lots of kefs in lots of rooms, and there's still a consistency in terms of how they, how the, the way the sound from a certain frequency upwards there's consistency so you, you can you can what's what you can see not what i'm looking for how sounds if that makes sense or designs or mm -hmm. or there are there are things you can get from it if that makes sense they can it can mm -hmm. be useful um and there, i'm sure there are there are reviewers that measure things much more detailed and to those people it probably they can probably get a lot more out of sorry Shane, I'm, I'm struggling to explain what i mean so you can learn a lot from it if you understand it, but it, obviously if you don't, then you are, it's hard, isn't it? What if you, what if one room's got a lot of acoustic treatment and one room is made out of glass and you take that LS50 in there, one's going to sound harsher than the other one. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You would expect all, 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 that'd be all speakers. We would expect that. Yeah. Um, so that's like, would uh, it measure different? Would it measure different? I bet it would probably possibly measure similar. That would be, uh, at the listening because, position. Yeah, well, because that, that depends what you're measuring. You're measuring, are you measuring frequency or are you measuring time decay? There's a big difference there in terms of what, which is where Rue comes in because it shows you time decay and other RT60 times and other things. I suppose. I guess, but I, I would still think that it would probably sound brighter in the, the room without with hard walls rather than. Of course, walls. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like, it's like if I got some speakers in there, was kind of brightish bright speakers i think kefs are, tend to be kind of on the bright side It'd probably sound way brighter in that room without no treatment than it would in a room with a lot of treatment where and then if the guy was like oh man dude you said the speaker perfectly balanced it's not really that bright but in my room it's super bright yeah. whereas if you took a softer speaker that's a little bit softer sound like a q acoustics and you put that same speaker in the bright room without any acoustic treatments that's probably gonna be a lot more comfortable listen over the speakers that are a little bit brighter since they're not as piercing and it's not as reflective off that hard surface. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, there's the measurements and there's the actual, what are you hearing type of thing? Yeah. So I think you gotta have to take in consideration like room acoustics and stuff like that. But I, I guess, you know, I could see people, people value the measurements. I mean, I do, I like to look at measurements still, but I know that speaker is probably just gonna sound a little different in my room than yours. People well, love that, to be in, People love the B&W speakers, the 803s. Yeah. I, th I hated them. I just thought they were okay. And they're like $13,000 speakers or $10,000 speakers or something like that. And uh, me and my, my buddy was here listening to them against the Martin Logans. We're like, oh, the, the Bowers are going to trounce them because they got the diamond tweeter. And I was like, oh, yeah, awesome. And then it just, it just wasn't that good sounding. Um, we tried multiple amplifiers and everything. Just, bah, dude, it just wasn't it. And I think they measure, they're supposed to measure, they're supposed to be kind of bright soundings from everything that I've read and heard. They tend to be so, supposed to be 
well, very detailed. Uh, uh, that wasn't the case well, for us. If, well, if you look at it, it wasn't the case. Oh, interesting. No, I mean, maybe, maybe the eights, maybe the eights are different, but I've, I've reviewed the 606 recently and the 705 signature recently. And I've put the both direct live measurements up. Oh, lost the light. Put direct live measurements up against each other. And it's very, very, very similar behavior. So a bit of a dip and mm -hmm. then a peak up for the treble up at about 10 kilohertz. Quite a noticeable peak up there in terms of the frequency response of those uh, Bowers and Wilkins speakers, which seems excessive until you look at the science of equal loudness. And if you look at equal loudness, well, then humans apparently need a lift at that point. Mm. But, but I think different humans hear that in different ways, probably in different rooms, different systems. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the Bowers, supposedly there's like the little 2K dip. I think all Bowers have a little dip on the high side there. I a dip in a peak, I think, from memory. Yeah, yeah. I so I'd love to pull it up on the screen and show, yeah. 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 The, my, my Trinov guy was looking at the measurements. He goes, you have a Bauer. He goes, you have an all Bowers system, don't you, in every single one of your locations? I was like, yeah. He's like, how do you know? He goes, there's a little 2K dip there. He goes, every single Bowers has a little 2K dip. I was like, why is that? He goes, just their engineer it likes to put that dip. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Was... Yeah, because not, not all speakers measure completely smooth. Some yeah. of them are measuring a little bit up and down. Yeah. That doesn't mean they're going to sound terrible. And yeah. I think sometimes when a speaker does measure up and down and then your room correction system puts the, the straight curve on it, yeah. people don't like it because yeah. that is changing, which, which is what I was saying at the start about how a, a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't always give you the best results. And really, yeah. you want a, an individual tailored result for that room, for that system, pushing that system as much as possible. And that, I think that's very difficult to do from an automation points of view i was listening to the guys from trinov on a different podcast a couple of weeks ago and even they were saying that they've got dedicated installers that go out and you know t take it to the next level if that makes sense because they understand yeah. the systems and a human pair of ears makes judgments different to what an algorithm can do yeah with the barrel speakers i have now i feel when i use the rack or when i do it with the trinov i have to limit it to about 10k and i, I like okay. to have the high untouched Otherwise, it tends to, I think there's a natural roll-off on some of them, on some of the room corrections. I know the Trinov has a, a, a default roll-off because I think kind of like a cinema EQ, like re-EQ yeah. used to have and THX yeah. used to have. I think that's kind of like their default. I think direct, I don't know if direct was the same way or not. But I, I think when they, because I find, like I, like I was saying, I didn't find the Bowers to be that detailed, and with especially with the room correction, so I had to kind of limit it just so I can have the natural response up top, which which is uh, you know, okay for me. I, I would like it to be a little bit brighter, I guess. I guess I like kind of bright speakers, but the Bowers just didn't have that top end sparkle that I'm so used to. So with the room correction in my theater, I have to limit it so I can just keep okay. its natural extension. Yeah. Well, obviously with, with the direct, you could go in and manually adjust that and tweak it and tweak it and tweak it until you get it exactly how you like it. Yeah. But w w whether it was sound exactly how you like it, because you might be basing it off a different speaker that behaves differently. But back, back to that manual control is like, well, I, I want more of this. I can try and push, which is, which is what I mean by kind of pushing the system to it, to its limits. I want more bass kick. I want, I want a more physicality, you know, from the sound of the system. And then you, you can, with direct, you can adjust, adjust the shape of the curve to get it exactly within reason exactly how you like it which is again that's the one reason why i really like that solution because as far as i'm aware it's the only one that gives you that level of specific control maybe trinoff does as well i haven't played with that but outside of that you know that's the only one that i've worked with that i that i feel like i'm in control of rather than i'm pressing a button and hoping that it gives me what i want if that makes sense yeah yeah you can you, that's the cool thing about these systems you can really dial into your uh to your liking because what is it? It's like flat by by for direct default, right? They try to give you a flat curve. Uh, or is it slight slope, uh, slope down, right? I, f I think it's following like a basic Harman curve, and it's trying to give you twenty to twenty. Mm. But um, obviously, I'm sure there's a technical reason for that for that curve. But in uh, a lot of systems, that can sound a little bit lean, and it can yeah. sound a little bit a little bit lackluster up top for for a lot of people. So the the curves that I normally put in are wildly different to what that gives you as a standard curve. And I know some people download the Harman ones that give you a bit of a bass lift yeah. and stuff, and that can give you more bass, but I don't always think that's quite the right shape. Um, so sometimes maybe it does work perfectly, but nor normally it's surprising 
the kind of the curve shape you go with to try and achieve the best sound. Yeah. And what's, what's been really surprising for me is when I started doing it as a service for people, I thought, well, I'll just be able to do the same thing in every system to achieve the same sound. But to achieve the same standard of sound, I've had to do things really quite different. And you, and you can tell that because you can load up the target curve that you've used previously, listen to it, and it, and it sounds completely wrong. And you think, well, that, you know, I, I've had to, well, to achieve the same end type of result, I've had to do things really quite different with every single calibration that I've done on every different system. And um, I, I, I definitely wasn't expecting that at the start, but that's how it's gone, um, which is why it normally takes me so long. It normally takes me, you know, six six plus hours to, to, to get it right because there's a lot of trial and error testing and pushing mm -hmm. to try and get the best sound out of the system that's there, um, which is, again, why I like that, like that light direct because it, it allows you to do that. Yeah, I heard you I heard you get a shout out on a pretty big channel recently. I was like, oh, this guy mentioned Terry in his video. Was that John Darko? Was it by yeah. any chance? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know John really well, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we've got another question here for you. Uh, where was it? Is Terry familiar with BEQ and how it brings back the missing 0 to 30 hertz LV in movie soundtracks? Uh, <laughs> is that... I've, I've not heard of this before, so is that... What are we just talking about with the? Do you think with the um, the, the, the the new Godzilla King Kong movie? Is that is that? I, I don't know if the customer snoots can answer can answer that for us. Is that is that what he means? Is that I, I'm not sure what that is. Sorry, explain. Can someone explain that? Yeah, I haven't done it myself, so I really can't tell you exactly oh, how it okay. works. <laughs> but I know they apply custom curves to movie soundtracks. To yeah, like if there's a filter, some movies will have filters on them. Um, like say uh, War of the Worlds. The DTS okay. track had much more bass below like 20 hertz over the 4K. The 4K version, I think they kind of, they put a filter on it and it cuts off at like 30 hertz or something like that. So, is that actually is that actually a thing? I, I, again, yeah, I heard this a on a, a podcast, but I didn't know if that was actually a real thing or if that was just someone's, no, I, I listened to it. It didn't sound the same. So I assume yeah. that's what they've done, but that's yeah. actually a, a, an actual thing that people have tested. Yeah, that's definitely. A thing. I've, I went back and listened oh, to myself. Right. I was like, that's one of my uh, favorite movies Tom Cruise's uh, is that movie and I, I remember watching multiple times I blew up an SVS subwoofer watching that movie when the thunder you remember when the thunder comes down yeah 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 yeah. that was the early days when SVS first came out and they uh, had the, the tubes and the external amps the Samson yeah. amps and uh, I was watching that I was just cranking it all of a sudden my subwoofer just popped I was like oh <laughs> shit man I was like god damn um, but then I watched it again when it first came out I was like I was like, something is not right with the soundtrack. I was like, there's like barely any bass anymore. You pop in the DTS mix, so much more robust, yeah. Because the reason I said that is because I remember people moaning about some of the Star Wars soundtracks not being bassy enough or not being dynamic enough. But I, I didn't really experience that when I watched those movies. And I just wondered if, if it's to do with how how systems are set up, how they how you... How you, yeah, how you set them up basically, and the levels that you're setting, whether it's related to that or whether it's actually related to the to the content. So is it is it mastered differently as opposed to being mastered m missing something? That's what I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know what the process is over there, but I know it's uh, it's different. It's a different sounding mix, though. I mean, it's a little bit more so immersive, that... but it just the the low the low end is just kind of capped off. So that's Dolby Atmos versus DTS. Back in the day, versions. Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. Yeah. DTS HD version, and I guess BEQ what, what? people will apply filters in for BEQ to bring back the the lower levels. Okay. But then, but then, if you watch a movie, you have to load up this curve in Odyssey or whatever they're using. So it's uh, different well, for every movie. So you're always futzing around. It's not like one yeah, curve fits all type yeah. of thing. Which, which is funny enough. That's that's another thing that sometimes people say. Oh, you know, do a, do you have a different curve or calibration for music? And for home cinema, I don't think you do. I don't think you need it really. If it's if the system is balanced correctly, it should sound balanced for every content. That that's my my smart take on it. Yeah. You know, like certain certain processors now have memory one, memory two, so you can do different things. Um, I always feel like the, the balance of the system is the balance of the system. Um, I, I always find that quite an interesting one. I, I can see it making sense if you've got a drop down screen, so you have a different calibration for screen up, screen down. That makes makes sense to me but um not not having different one for music and for movies maybe it's just because i'm from the i've only got one i've got to make one the best it can be i'm, I'm from kind of from that kind of background so yeah. maybe maybe that's why 
Do you, do you feel like you should use room correction on a two channel setup or just home theater only? Uh, I always use, I always use, always use it exclusively. Yeah. Always use it. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The better speakers sound closer. To, in my opinion, anyway, the better speakers that I've listened to that are more cohesive, um, yeah. time better and have a better in room frequency response sound more like a, a system that's been corrected with a calibration to me that that is how i hear it oh well this sounds like it's already had a direct calibration applied to it but i, I do know there are exceptions to certain rules but I, I think i can't help but see a speaker in a room see something like a rue graph or a dirac graph knowing full well it's going to be nothing like how it should be and then to me it's like well if it's not tracking roughly like how it should be we're not we're not hearing the content how you should be hearing it regardless of how the source works if that makes sense how pure your signal chain is if the room makes the speaker do this in its response well then we're not you're not hearing the content how it was designed you can't be it's impossible so for me it's it's um yeah always always yeah yeah i always feel i feel do, do you think differently do you feel, okay. i don't know i'm kind of on okay. the fence i have Dirac on the m33 i think it it sounds really awesome. But at the same time, I'm like, ah, I feel like you shouldn't be touching that kind of stuff. Like you should just leave it as is and on the merits of the speakers and the amp itself. So I'm kind of, I feel indifferent about it. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like if I was going to get like a whole Mac rack, Mac stack, um, I would, I would just think I'm just going to let it just shine on its own, not introduce any digital equalization to it. Just get my, my distances right and everything. And not touch it. But, like it should just sound great automatically. But I know that's not always the case. But you know, what I mean. well, it, it is the case. Except the the room is an equalizer, isn't it? The, the room is its own equalizer. So mm -hmm. if that, so that that is changing the response of the speaker, and reflectivity is changing how you hear the speaker, and it's it's a it's a gray area because obviously it can be very subjective. But yeah, you know. It is, it is a thing. It's definitely a thing. It's happening. It's happening in every room. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I personally think that the, the, the better the starting point, the, the, the more consistent things sound as well, rather than, well, this sounds good. This sounds terrible. This sounds good. This sounds terrible. W when you have a, a better setup, more content becomes a bit more consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 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 been my experience but i would never tell, to tell anybody what they should and yeah. shouldn't be doing that's definitely not you know the case but there's reasons why i do it. yes yeah yeah i do feel uh i feel a little different a different about it sometimes sometimes I was like yeah well, let's just just do it and there's other stuff i guess it depends on what gear i have at the time i'm like oh dude this one i gotta just leave this one alone and then some other newer digital stuff i'm like i wish this had some eq on it or something so you know whatever i can go either way it doesn't matter either, just as long as it sounds good, I guess. Mm. Um, what's another question here? Do, 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 do. Uh, Simon says BMW 800 series speakers take many hours to break in and don't sound good at first. I guess, I mean, I had for almost a year, so I think I put about several hundred hours on there. We just wasn't, just wasn't enamored with it. Wasn't feeling it, yeah. yeah. The, the Martin Logans we had at the time just. I, I like the sound of Martin Logan's because it's all transparent sounding. What, are you talking about electrostatics? Are you? Yeah, electrostatics. Yeah. Well, that that's a totally yeah totally different sound. And, yeah. Uh, I've not heard them a lot. I've heard really good, really good the, the twenty thousand pound ones. Yeah. I've heard them. I think they were fifteen thousand pound ones. Uh, at at PMC PMC, I think are the UK distributors now for Martin Logan. I got to go up there and got to listen to quite a good PMC system with uh, and Bryston with the Martin Logan. So yeah. that was interesting and I've, I've done a calibration for a guy who had some out in a, out in a huge great big room and it's, it's back to that kind of delicacy it's a, it's yeah. a delicacy of the presentation yeah which like to, to get that sometimes to get that out of out of box speakers is why people use tube gear tube preamps and tube amplifiers because yeah. it, it helps to give them that kind of delicate um even with clip speakers like we was talking about before wasn't it even with clip speakers it was you saying that clips is a delicate sounding speaker is yeah. that what you're saying yeah. Yeah. crazy, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> i've only heard it once i've only heard it once but it was very 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 delicate yeah uh what else here let's take one more question that we can get out of here so we're at like 90 minutes already 
Um, oh, wow. I think there was something for you here. Uh, for subwoofer integration, how much, if any, experience has Terry had with Direct Live base control feature, and how well does he think it works or improves upon standard DRAC? Right. Uh, interesting experience. When it, when it first came out, I was a little bit indifferent with it, not because I didn't think it worked, but what I was noticing with, with Arkham products, there was a very big volume change with the base output. So you, you would run the base control and then the subwoofer level would be set too low. And I think they've improved that. I think that's quite a bit better now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's less of an indifference, but I, I still find it sets it a little bit low in terms of the volume, but you can bring the volume back with just an increase in base, you know, your base levels within within the process or the AV receiver to find the right balance. But what, what it, it definitely seems to tighten up the base, which is partly why there is a, a less perceived base, if that makes sense. So the tighter, more integrated the base is, the less of it there is, because there's less bloom, there's less boom, there's less excess yeah. on the sound. So it's it's a case of kind of a, a bit a little bit of brain retraining, if that makes sense, because a, a little bit of fat on bass can be pleasing. It can it can be what what, what goes through your body. It can be cuddly in terms of things, it, even for home cinema. So, I think when you when you run it, it, it can take it out a little bit, and you can just push the volume back up and, and br bring the physicality back to the sound. That's but it's it's clever. It's very very clever. I, I wish I understood it more to to, to discuss it more. But um, it's it's definitely clever what they're trying to do. And they, yeah. Again, obviously, you know, I promote Direct a lot because, you know, I do work with it, but I I like what they're doing. I'm impressed that they're trying to build on a system that's already very good rather than just rest on their laurels. They're trying to, you know, take it further, make it better. Because um, that can only benefit everybody, can't it? It can only benefit us, us as enthusiasts. Yeah, definitely can. Do you have to pay extra for the Arcam? Yeah, it's... Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's three hundred and fifty dollars for a single subwoofer and four hundred and ninety nine dollars for a multi sub. Yeah. It's, is it? Uh, it's it's not it's not it's, uh, values value, isn't it? Really, is I, I tell you why it's not expensive because if you bought that Arcan processor and used it for ten years, then a couple of hundred pounds to get better performance is cheaper than buying another whole product to get. Yeah. A better base management system so actually it's much if, if you if, be, better sound is better sound regardless where it comes from so uh, uh, that's a small percentage of what a new unit would cost i suppose is probably a good way to to describe it uh to, to explain a, a justification of value yeah just and, like... and if they don't make if they don't make the money they can't invest the time into it either can they so mm. you, you are kind of you're investing in your own future for better sound from Hopefully, Dirac is a system that you're invested in, so they need your money to, to make it better as well, if that makes sense. So you're kind of helping yourself for the future. Yeah, I, that's, what I, that's what I say when I say, uh, you know, if you spend uh, 30 grand on a processor now and it's relevant for 10 years, you're getting your money's worth. Yeah. I'll tell you what, this is, this is the thing some people say, I have, to, I have to choose between a car and, I don't know, speaker upgrade. <laughs> yeah okay yeah, yeah. which could be could be the decision right or holiday yeah. and speaker upgrade that could be the decision so if, it, it, obviously it's all just how you look at it for me if I, I get my car i drive it home i'm all excited then it sits outside my house getting dirty constantly and i might drive it to and from work or drive it here and there whereas if you're spending hours and hours and hours every single day with your hi-fi system or your home cinema system well then it's it's a justified way to spend money isn't it really you, you are you are using it and you're possibly using it more than the car. Whereas if you spend it and don't use it, well, then it, it doesn't make sense. But if you use it a lot, then mm -hmm. it's to me that that would be my justification. How much time, you know, how much time am I going to use this and how much, I suppose how much it means to you as well, isn't it really? It's, it's based around that, but how, yeah. how, you know, how much am I going to use this and what am I going to get out of it? Yeah. Money, money's a touchy subject over here on my channel. I, <laughs> I notice in the comment section all the time, very touchy with people. <laughs> well, everybody's got different different budgets, haven't they? You know, I've got I know people that have got crazy, really crazy high end systems, you know, and, and other people that have just got you know have, have more average type stuff. But yeah, if you can if you can get an experience out of it and enjoy it, then it, then it's the same. It's the same, isn't it? Really, it's the same. Um, but much to my sins, I've been watching the Marvel movies with my eight year old son. 
yeah. over the last I don't know few months for the first time for him. And we're just watching it on a TV with TV sound. So it's uh, cr- criminal in a way Shame when you've got you. like, a home cinema system. Yeah, it's criminal, but it, it, it's convenient for, for the eight-year-old, if that makes sense. It's easier to sit him down in front of the telly. And you know what? I've enjoyed, because uh, the movies are great, I've enjoyed all of them, even just watching them on the TV. So I know that's not the, the promotion we should be saying for home cinema enthusiasts, but at, it's, at least the, sound it's bar, the real huh? world. No, no, just sound speakers speakers. <laughs> it's not even a new it's not even a new TV. It's, it's an eight year old Panasonic ZT plasma that my dad gave me a couple of months ago, funnily enough. So uh actually still a good TV, actually, surprisingly. Hold hold on. Did you have you got a projector in your theater or no? Yeah, no projector in the theater, yeah. What, what do you got in there? Uh a bank a BenQ I can't think of the, the model. It's twenty I'm not sure. BenQ. It's the it's the black one that they did for home cinema. It was one of the first projectors that had tone mapping, which is the reason mm-hmm. why I bought that one because I had a Sony before, very expensive 4K Sony, yeah. And it it would struggle with HDR content or struggle. It wasn't a HDR projector, but it would just without tone mapping, it, the brightness goes up and down, yeah. And you get blown out scenes, yep. And it's really quite frustrating. Projectors just can't map like TVs. So the BenQ mm-hmm. that actually does a pretty good job of keeping the scenes more consistent. And because when it's going too bright, too dark, it it just throws you out of what you're watching. If that makes sense, it's, so when the, when the when it's more consistent, it's just easier to just watch something rather than uh, if you had any hair pulling your hair out for ah, uh, oh, it doesn't it doesn't look right, you know. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's noisy though. It's a noisy projector, like fan noise and uh, the uh, wheel, the wheel DLP, you know, the color wheel. It's quite noisy, um, but it's not it's not bad actually for the money. It's not bad. Do you, do you notice a rainbow effect on you, on yours? No, not at all. No. I was worried about that, actually. I was really worried about that. Um, really worried. In- interestingly, the first one I had, this is the, I've got, well, it's the same one, I think. When you would watch HDR content, it would have, do you remember, I don't know if you would ever have seen it, what you call like a fluctuating black level. Within a, Panasonic plasma TVs used to do it, so you would watch, and it would go from darker, lighter, darker, darker, yeah. lighter, darker, where it was just in the black level. Well, the BenQ projector was doing that. I think it was tone mapping. So I think it was trying to find the right tone map and then it would change to so get it and then it would go off wrong and then back to it again and off and wrong. And that, that was annoying me, but then I, I sent it back to them. They did a firmware update and it came where came back and sorry, it was, it was fine after that. So uh, that was the only real negative thing about it and the fan noise and the, the noise. But um, I think it was, about two thousand five hundred pounds, so it's quite a reasonable amount of money. But for a for a projector, that's not that's not crazy money at all. Um, that's at the lower end of projectors. Yeah. Projectors are expensive, aren't they? They're very expensive. Yes, um, they are. What do you run? What are you, what are you running? Uh, I got the JVC NX Seven. Yeah, NX7, so yeah. expensive, expensive. I guess it's all relative, you know. <laughs> I've always wanted the JVC. How good is it, and how much better is it than what you had before? I had the Sony one before. I would say if I had to put a percentage on it, like thirty percent better, okay. twenty five thirty percent better. That's pretty which big. Sony? Better. Maybe twenty percent. Which one? Better. Which one? Uh, which one? I had this Sony six seventy five or six six ninety five. I think it was. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. okay. It was like ten grand at the time. Hmm. Uh, that's quite that's quite a recent one. See, the, the Sony projector yeah. I had was the very first 4K one, the VW500, which was big, big and bright, very bright. Yeah, it, it, it was missing a lot of the newer, the newer technology. So, um, the 675 should have been a good projector. Oh no, it was definitely a good projector. It's just mm. the JVC was better. Was <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had the 675 for a couple of years. Oh, and, okay. Uh, yeah, just yeah, the black levels are just better on. Uh, yeah. On the JVC. Plus, JVC has a frame by frame tone mapping now, which is like it helps does. out a lot. Yeah. 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 So you, you've experienced that, haven't you? The difference of tone oh, mapping yeah. and no tone mapping. It does make a difference. It really yeah. does. Yeah, definitely. And and the Sony's, for whatever reason, has sometimes the Sony's could get banding. You could see banding in their projectors, whereas the, the uh, JVC, you don't get any banding in it. Okay. I, I didn't notice that. I don't, I don't remember banding. I don't remember that. But that's going to bother me a little bit. Mm. I always thought do, it was like that was a movie. Just, was that? Do you think that might be a screen screen distance issue or something like that? Or? Nah, it's just like a known thing that it's only had like had oh, banding wow. at the time. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think at the time too. I, I don't think um, when I had that one, I think HDMI was capped at like thirteen gig. 
gigabits per second instead of the 18, which 4K should have been. Yeah. I think that's what was causing the issue. Oh, wow. But the newer ones, I think, are now 18. So, yeah. obviously, your room is similar size to me. What screen do you have and how big is your screen? I got, well, I, I had a Stuart in here for a little bit, which is a CinemaScope to, to, uh, 21 by 9. That was just a 1.0 gain. Then I wanted to, since I got the Procellas in here, I wanted to put the speakers behind the screen. So now I got an Elite Screens, a Weave material, which basically looks like spandex. Um, not uh, as bright, I'm going to say. It took, it took maybe like a 10% hit in brightness. Maybe, I, maybe I wonder a if less. you've got a very, a very similar screen. Is it like a soft material? Is the material soft of the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you might have the same similar screen to me. That's a very, very interesting. Is it designed for close range? Is it a close range screen? Um, I mean, I'm about seven, eight feet from it. So, I mean, that's, that's yeah, pretty close. Yeah, yeah real that's close. close. Yeah, yeah because I, I remember demoing two different screens, and the screen I wanted was the punchier, brighter. Yeah. Uh, but I couldn't have it because as soon as light went on it you could see the weave of the screen so i had to go oh, with the screen i didn't really want yeah but i couldn't see the screen if that makes sense the screen material if that makes sense as much for the same kind of viewing distance about eight feet mm. that's very close isn't it it's very close i mean how big how big is your screen it's a 120 yes you that's a bigger screen i've got 110 so yours is it hundred? yeah so you're an even bigger screen so yeah well mine is uh, a minus 21 nine. It's a little bit wider yeah 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 what, like movie scopes two three five yeah. to one that one yep. yeah 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 at, at, at that distance that's a greedy screen shane that's what i call that's when you're greedy you want it that's <laughs> big <laughs> i tried to Immersive. uh i mean that's the biggest i could fit in my i would have went wall to wall if i could have yeah. but uh my my throw distance is too short and the only yeah, way i could yeah. get it to go to get that big was to put an anamorphic lens on it if not i'd be stuck at 100 inches so so with the lens i was able to scoot out another 20 inches Oh, so you've got an anamorphic lens. Is that what you're using that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I got another screen coming in, I think, end of this week. Uh, it's Stuart's. Stuart's got a new weave coming out. That's coming in. That's um, the one I have right now is like $500. Uh, the Stuart screen, I think it's something like $3,400. $3, so I'm, uh, expe wow. oh, I'm wow. expecting it to be a lot better. Hopefully it is. So that that's should be my new reference screen for the time being yeah yeah that's interesting mm -hmm. to, to play around with that I, I, I haven't done any of that as, as uh pursuit perfect system i say it's been mostly hi-fi and the, the logistics of that would be very difficult for me with where my screen uh, i built my room around a tv and then realized that i needed a, i needed a projector i saw a yeah. good one in a black room and I, I couldn't get an idea out of my head so I, yeah. I built the screen into the room if that makes sense so electric one that drops up and down yeah to sit in front of the speakers TV. yeah okay. so yeah so that's now uh, <laughs> so that was quite logistically diff difficult and it's not it's not the same as just having it on the back wall which makes much more sense um but my fear was you can't shine through the speakers can you if that yeah. makes sense so it needs to the screen needs to be in front yeah but that means having it about a meter or more into the room to, yeah. to drop down in front of the speakers um so to try and review another screen would be very difficult for me <laughs> yeah, so we have, to, yeah, yeah. we have to leave that one with you shane you have to give us the information for that i mean usually if you uh, you know they make stands like if you're going to review it they'll give you stands uh well. so you don't have to like mount it you can put them on their stands and then uh, just okay. fold everything back up send it back yeah well there you go then there you go mm -hmm. <laughs> I, d I didn't know that was a thing that that yeah. to be honest, i wouldn't mind that full stop actually just get it out put it away although that is one of the worst things about about we've discussed this before wasn't we you kind of you do feel unsettled a lot of the time because you're constantly changing things. And yeah. um, sometimes as, a, as an enthusiast, you just want to get amazing picture or get amazing sound and then enjoy it. You know, just, wow, I've worked really hard. This sounds great. I just want to enjoy this now for six months, but you can't because you've got to take it out and start again, yeah. constantly start again. And so it's, it's, I think, uh, people, I think you don't realize what that's like until you do it. Yeah. I think when, she, like when I first started YouTube, probably, probably for you too, you're just excited to get a lot of product in. So you're like, yeah, I'll switch it out. That's fine. I'll switch it out. And then after a while, it's like, man, I just want to watch a movie and just, just yeah. enjoy it. And it's, <laughs> it's hard to because you're always taking something out every other month. Do you, do you still get excited, though, when people approach me? I'm like a kid at Christmas. I, I say yes to everything because it's like, oh, wow, I'm really excited. I want to hear that. I want to try that. I want to I yeah. experience that. Do you still have that excitement? 
only on certain products I get excited for. Not not like not like everything. Not like everything. I mean, there's a bunch of products that got announced recently that uh, I kind of don't float my boat. I know a lot of people are talking about it, but sometimes like the the, the subwoofers we're gonna get tomorrow. I was excited because uh, I mean they're track. You know, we're talking about this. They're attractive looking. I think they're really good looking subs, mm -hmm. and you know they have a pedigree behind them. They're supposed to sound excellent, and I haven't had a small subwoofer in that that rocked forever everything is usually gigantic so that yeah. that's exciting so it really depends on what did, it is did you did you test them for home cinema did you i did for both okay okay so i'm gonna so, see, I, I, both in I, there. I only did music i could only do music so uh, and I, I said i say in the video like I, I feel like this isn't complete because i haven't tested this for for home cinema so if they want to know about home cinema speak to you or watch your video maybe watch mine for the music side of yeah. um because that, that's really important for for, for those subwoofers, isn't it? How good yeah. they are for music. Really yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. We hooked them up to the, um, I paired them up with the M33, the NAD, and then oh, the wow. Focals. And uh, yeah, they rocked, man. They rocked. I think you might have a tendency to turn them up a little louder because they're subwoofers. But, uh, you know, for these ones, you kind of have to really get them perfectly blended so you don't tell that they're there type of thing. Well, I, I had a little bit of a leg up because, uh, someone from real delivered it and set it up for me so that gave oh, me a, a better starting point yeah, when, okay. within two minutes it took them two minutes and when i measured it after i was like oh well i've done a good job i was impressed <laughs> by that so yeah. uh but obviously i still changed it i still obviously calibrated it for dirac and did, did all the things i would normally do but um they did a good job of getting the phase correct by ear and, and the important basics if that makes sense was all done um very quickly and, and done by ear which impressed me because it's not easy it's not easy to yeah. do that it's not easy did he um did he set it up, get it done by your at the subwoofer, or did 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 you turn it and he listened to it? No, well, basically, basically brought it, installed it, listened to it, moved it a little bit, adjusted the phase and the volume and the crossover point, and then I listened to it then, and then I got the microphone out, measured to see what it was actually doing, mm. and I was quite impressed by um, it's either blind luck or <laughs> where it was in the room measured unbelievably good from an output point of view and an extension point of view and it filled lots of nulls from the speaker as well i was like oh, wow that's just and i would never ever have put a supper for there ever in my room it's like the last place i would put one so it could be luck because where i would normally put it there was four predators and i couldn't if that makes yeah. sense so it had to go had to go somewhere else and uh I was really impressed by that in terms of, but I think maybe it, because it was in front of the other subwoofers, it was seeing boundary gain, if that makes yeah. sense. So yeah. yeah, it was out in the room, but it's getting boundary gain because of the other subwoofers giving, act, acting like a corner basically of the room. Yeah. Uh, it's good. They're good. They are good. They're yeah, going to make a lot of people very happy. Yeah. They're going to make so. a lot of people very happy. Yeah. I think so. Um, but all right, let's, uh, let's wrap this up here. We're almost at two hours. Well, all right, guys. Yo, thanks for hanging out with us this afternoon. Thanks, Terry, for joining us as well. Be sure to go over to his channel and subscribe. Pursuit Perfect System on YouTube. I believe you got a uh, website as well. Website, yeah. And obviously, uh, I might as well plug myself. DirectLiveCalibration.com is the Direct Live Calibration service that I offer as well. So thank you. All right, guys. Uh, if you want to listen to the audio portion of this, I'll leave some links in the video's description. You guys can check that out on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, anywhere that you get your podcasts, uh, you most likely can find us there. So thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. We will see you again in the next video.